lot about the grace of God. Jesus came to this earth to take on the sins of the world. God has forgiven us. God has called us to live a life of faith. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 8. We're going to talk about a man who did just that, who obeyed God's word at every turn, at which point he gave his life to Jesus. We're going to talk about Philip. Philip was a man who obeyed the Holy Spirit. Philip was a man who allowed God to work in his life. Philip was a man that when God said go, he went. Philip was a man that when God gave him specific details, he followed the instructions and the details to the T. There's times in our lives when you and I are, are not sure of what we want to do with our own lives. And so um, we half step. We're a little unsure. And it's, it's kind of like an athlete who's unsure out on the field or on the court or in um, whatever sport that they're doing, if an athlete is unsure, they're not going to really know what to do. They're not going to be explosive. They're not going to be dynamic. They're not going to be powerful because they're unsure of, let's say a football player is unsure of which hole that he's supposed to get the ball and run through. My son Elisha's starting tackle football. And as he was learning all of the holes, the first couple of times, he was a little unsure of which hole to burst through until he began to get the hang of it and learn that when he gets that football, he's got to explode through that hole like a rocket. And the only way that we're able to explode and the only way we're, we're able to go and be and live the way God wants us to be is if we're certain of what God has called us to do. You and I know, you and I both know what it's like to feel unprepared. Raise your hand if you know what it's like to feel unprepared. Let me see. There should be hands going up all over this place. When we feel unprepared, is we lack confidence. When we feel unprepared, we're not sure about getting up here and saying and, and sharing a testimony, Brother Gabriel. We're a little unsure because it's new, and, and, and I'm only three weeks into Teen Challenge, but that's why they selected you. Because they're calling to see if whether you're sure or not if God has called you to do a work in your life and whether you're going to allow God and you're going to submit to God and whether we're going to submit to God. The Gospel of Luke in chapter 14 says, watch this. This is a word for us all today. If a man is to build a tower, suppose he wants to build the tower, will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. How many of you know that serving Jesus ain't easy? Any, any of us could say a prayer and ask God to forgive us for our sin and say, okay, I'm making an emotional decision and, and I'm going to invite Jesus to come into my heart. But serving Jesus is more than that. Serving Jesus is connecting word with deed. Serving Jesus is faith in action. Serving Jesus is when we take the theory, we put it into practice. It's a big difference than drawing it up on the board and then going out there and executing whatever it is that we're talking about or doing. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 8 verse 1. And Saul was there giving approval to his death, talking about the death of Stephen. We preached on this passage last week. And on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Everybody say, Judea and Samaria. Yeah. See, because they were in Jerusalem where the stoning was happening. But the stoning could not take place in the city of Jerusalem. So the, the martyrdom, the murder of Stephen took place outside the gates of, of Jerusalem where God was about to do something miraculous where the fulfillment of scripture was about to take place. The stoning of Stephen took place outside the city gates, and that was what brought about the scattering of all of God's people throughout Judea and Samaria. 
The book of Acts begins by saying, Jesus says, now go and take the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the what? The uttermost parts of the earth. But sometimes we're so content, sometimes we're so complacent, sometimes we're so comfortable with where we are and allowing sin to just hang around, chilling up in the kitchen like, yeah, I got you because you know what? You're not being obedient to God. I told you 10, God told you 10 times to go and do it and you didn't go and do it. So I got you now. Satan's right there. He's chilling. He's all up in your head. He's all up in your heart. Sin is still ruling over you. Sin is still your master. Sin is still my master. Bible says, according to Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, sin is crouching at your door. But you must master it. We must master sin. You could be a Christian. You could be a believer. You could, we could be a church goer, but guess what? Sin is still our master. We like to preach and we like to clap when people talk about Jesus being our master and our savior and the one who delivers us and, allow, and breaks us free and breaks the chains of bondage and say, praise God, hallelujah, my sins are forgiven. But guess what? Our sins are forgiven, but we're still choosing to allow sin to chill around all up in the hood, all up in our life, all up in the mix. But God is saying, no, you got to master it. But when we're unsure, when we're unsure, that's when sin has its way with us. When we're half-stepping, you get that football, and the, the little running back goes right, and he's, he doesn't know what to do. Boom! That's when he gets blown up. I remember my first opportunity to start second base at the University of Florida. I was a freshman. It was our first weekend series. I wasn't ready, Glenn. Coach said, you're starting today at second base, by the way. I was like, what? I was just a freshman, and... I hadn't started any of our practice games in the preseason. Coach said, you're starting, man. I wasn't ready. I struck out twice. Didn't help that I was facing the number one pitcher in the nation. But I looked like a little middle school baseball player out there against this guy throwing like 95. I wasn't ready. I was unsure. And I played like it. I got a ground ball, and man, I was the sweetest infielder, sweetest shortstop and second baseman. But guess what? I was so unsure of myself. My knees were practically shaking in my pants. We were playing in, we were playing in Coral Gables down there at Miami, University of Miami. My, my legs were going like this. It was all up on the television and everything. I swear they could have saw my knees, you know what I'm saying? They, they thought I was doing a dance, but nah, man. There was something coming down my leg, too. I was unsure. The ball came to me, and normally I just grabbed that ball, but guess what? I was unsure. I got that ball, and I balled the ball. And I was like, oh, and I got it over to first base. I was like, thank God. Please don't come to me. Please don't come to me. Please don't come to me. <laughs> you see, some of us in life, we're going through the motions. We act like we're living it. We act like we're doing it, but we're not. We're half-stepping. We got one foot in the world still, one foot in the church, and we act like we're doing it right, but we ain't. We're going through the motions. Jesus said, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but not lukewarm, because heaven will spit us out. Heaven will spit us out just like the whale spit, spat out Jonah. Look what it says right here. Verse 2, godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. They were mourning the death of Stephen, an innocent man. But Saul began to destroy. Who's Saul? Who is Saul, guys? Who is Saul? The Apostle Paul, right? The great man of God, the Apostle Paul. At least he was going all out for the world. At least he was going all out for Satan. At least he was going all out. He was sure of what he was doing, and that was that he was going to persecute Christians. He was going to try to kill as many as he could, throw as many as he could in jail to thwart the plans that God had. Somebody say amen. amen. At least he was sure about, sure about his sin. Some of us are so, so unsure about whether we're supposed to serve God or whether we're supposed to serve the world. We don't even know where we are. We don't know, even know up from down anymore. And I'm talking to us Christians, us churchgoers. This message today was probably more so about us than it is about anybody from Teen Challenge. Right. I don't want anybody in here thinking about, well, this message ain't for me. I'm, I hope they're getting the word. No. I hope that I'm getting the word too. Because God is speaking straight to my heart. God is preaching right to me. But Saul began to destroy the church. Everybody say, destroy the church. Destroy the church. 
You ever thought about somebody like, man, people break into churches? You ever thought about, remember we had the break in last year, guys? How could they break in and, and steal from the church? And we're like, oh, man, I want to kill them. I want to do this to them. But, just, but guess what? At least they knew who they were serving. At least they knew who they were serving. They knew what they were doing. They knew they were breaking into a church. They were chilling with Saul. But isn't that, isn't that who Jesus came to, to die for? Isn't that who Jesus came to save? You and I? You and I. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them into prison. Verse 4, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Here we go now. The Jews are now leaving. The Christians are now leaving Jerusalem, and now they're being scattered, going to Judea. Somebody say Judea. Because yeah. Judea is just the outskirts of where Jerusalem is. It's in the, the, where the tribe of Judah was established there in the south. Verse 5, here it is. Philip, somebody say Philip. Philip went down to a city in Samaria. You guys know about that place called Samaria? It's where the Samaritans are. They're called the half-Jews. Everybody knows that the Jews and the Samaritans, they didn't really get along because the Jews looked down on the Samaritans, and the Samaritans were angry that the Jews looked down on them. So they, whenever they saw each other, they always wanted to fight. It's like your other side of the family. Well, there you know, they're only half-family. They're only half-blood. Man, stop that. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs that he did, what did, what did Philip do? What did Philip do? Miraculous, come on, people. What did Philip do? Miraculous signs. And the people saw them. The people saw the miraculous signs that Philip was doing. They all paid close attention to what he said. When you see somebody doing some pretty amazing things, you kind of perk up and listen, don't you? Do you think my freshman year when I was at the University of Florida, unsure of myself, if I would have said, come on, guys, turn it around, let's go, guys, let's go. Do you think the guys would have been like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or do you think the guys would have been like, Because people are waiting and watching to see who God anoints. Are you anointed today? Are you sure of God's call on your life? Are we sure of God's call on our life? Because until we're sure, God can't use you the way he wants to use you. He may use you a little bit. But God can't use you all up. God can't use us all up if we're still unsure. you got to be all in. I talk about that a lot. We got to be all in. We got to be all in. We got to be writers. We got to be all in. We, we got to be sure. We have to be certain. And where does it all begin? It doesn't begin with you being sure in yourself. It doesn't begin with you being certain of who you are as just a person, a man or a woman or a father or a mother or a child or a brother or a sister or a cousin a grandfather or a grandmother. It's not sure about your identity as it is spoken to in the world sense. It's who you are. It's who you're certain about. It's who you're, watch this, confident in under the blood of Jesus. And we can't be confident of the work that Jesus has done. We can't be certain of God. We can't be sure of it unless we've completely entrusted ourselves and know that God's plan for your life is the plan that, that God has marked out for you and predestined since the beginning of time. You have to be certain about it. You've got to be sure about it. Watch this. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Man, there's great joy when people see that God's present, when God is working, when the power of God is on display. It should strengthen our faith. It should bring us to the point where we become bold for Christ and seeing that God is real and God is alive and God is working. And God is doing a, a deeper work in my life. 
There's great joy in the city. There's great joy at home. Mama and dad, mama and dad are, are, are just like, just like skiing through the house. When there's joy in the house, there's no arguing. There's harmony. The kids are happier. They're hugging. They're loving. They're not fighting. They're not bickering. They're not arguing. They're getting good grades. All the, all the fruit of the joy of the Lord is present. Somebody say amen. amen. But you have to be sure. Not sure about who you are as a man. Not sure about who you are as a woman. Sure about who you are in Christ. Now we're going to skip down to verse 26 because this is where it gets good. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now he's leaving. He's going beyond Judea, you guys. Get ready. So he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of the treasury of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. So he's got some Jewish roots there. This Ethiopian eunuch who served under the treasury of Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. And on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of the Isaiah prophet. Let me paint a picture for you. He was going down leaving Jerusalem, going towards the road, towards Gaza, guess what? In his chariot. And while this official was in his chariot, he was reading a scroll. He was reading the book of the prophet Isaiah, the Old Testament, because those were the scriptures of the time that they had. And you knew this guy had money because not everybody had scrolls because scrolls were expensive to make. But watch this. The chariot was in motion. It was moving. It wasn't parked over on the side of the road. He wasn't chilling in the shade. He wasn't just lounging on a lunch break, reading the word of God. He was on a journey. He was moving. Look what happens. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. So now here, the spirit speaks to Philip. Philip sees this chariot and God says, now go to the chariot. And Philip's like, that chariot moving? God's like, yeah. So he starts going. And he's following. And he goes and he starts running. And he picks up some speed. He picks up some speed. Sure enough, he goes. And he's, he's running alongside the chariot. And he's, he's looking and he's listening. And he's like, oh, wow. There's one of the officials from Ethiopia. This, this man was an official. You didn't, nobody just went up to officials if you didn't also come from a royal house. Because you have to be equally yoked to go and present yourself to anybody who represented the queen in any circumstance or nation. So guess what? Philip had to be sure that God was giving him specific instructions to go and speak to somebody that, in a sense, is over him. You guys see what I'm talking about? If President Obama walked up in here right now, most of us would go like this. Oh, dang, there's President Obama. Someone said, hey, go up and talk to him. You're like, no, nah, man, you go up and talk to him. You have to be sure of yourself. Sure in who? In ourselves or in Christ? In Christ. Look what it says. Verse 30. Philip ran to the chariot and heard the man reading the prophet Isaiah. He ran. That's how sure he was. He, he didn't. No, he took off. He heard God speak, and he was obedient right away. He responded to the call of God. He responded to the word of God. Somebody say faith in action. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where being sure, that's where being certain, that, that means knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt. He goes up and he hears the man reading the Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? He's, he's, he's running his, Philip asked, verse 31, how can I? Unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Pull over, pull over. They pull over, they stop. Philip jumps in the chariot. Now Philip is riding in the chariot with the Ethiopian eunuch who's headed down towards Gaza to go back to Ethiopia. Are you guys with me? Somebody say amen. amen. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter as a lamb 
before the sure is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. Philip explained that the man that the eunuch was reading about in the prophet Isaiah was a prophetic Old Testament scripture that was pointing forward to Jesus. Verse 36, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared to Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. We have baptisms this afternoon at Cabrillo Beach. How many of us has God been speaking to this last month and a half since we've been announcing baptisms and you've been afraid to be baptized? If God has spoken to you and told you that you need to be baptized and you're being disobedient, we're not doing the word of God. We're not obeying the word of God. We're not living out the word of God. The eunuch, after hearing the explanation of the messianic prophecies about Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the one who was called to die for your sins and mine, that we might have life and live life abundantly, obeyed and said, look, I know I have a long way to Ethiopia. But I don't see why we can't just pull over right now and take a little dip. I don't see why right now I shouldn't just stand up and be baptized. There's about 15 people signed up on the list to be baptized. How many of us are unsure about who we are in Christ? Because that would be the only reason why you don't get baptized this afternoon. That would be the only reason. Not how good you are. Not because you still got to get some things right and things ordered in your life. God don't care about any of that. If the Ethiopian eunuch would have thought about what he needed to get right in his life, he would have never been baptized. If Philip did not obey God and was not sure of who he was and that God was sending him to, to Samaria, that God would be using him to take the gospel out of Judea and into that great region of the Gentiles, to continue to preach the gospel. We see throughout the book of Acts, we're not even there yet, as God continues to unfold the great mission and great commission of Jesus Christ to baptize people from all nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. How many of you guys are seeing that God wants all of you? How many of you guys are seeing that God says, are you committed to me or not? And if you are and you've not been baptized yet, right now is the time to go and be baptized. And how many of us is God saying, no, now go, like Philip, Listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit and begin to be used. Share your story. Be used of God. Do your best to try to start explaining the scriptures and who this man named Jesus is that changed your life. That's the essence of what Teen Challenge is doing, that they're going and sharing about the work that God is doing in their life right now. There's no greater time. There's no greater place. There's no greater obedience. There's no greater walk. There's no greater life than to obey God and say, God, I'm all yours. I'm all in. Here I go. Because when you're on fire with Christ, guess what? You're going to every, lead everybody to Jesus. You're going to leave your unsaved, unsaved father to Jesus who said, yeah, you know, Teen Challenge is good for you. You need to go there. You got a problem. But he doesn't know Jesus yet. Your mother who says, you know what? You really need to get some help. But she don't know Jesus yet. She just knows that you haven't got things together to have success in this world or hold down a job or do some of the very practical things that all of us want to do. But guess what? Being lovers of ourselves will cause us to be unsure of who we are in Christ. Right. It'll cause us to have an identity crisis. We got all, all talks of identity crisis throughout the world right now related to our sexual uh, identity. 
Whether we're man, whether we're female, where I want to change and become a man. But guess what? What's the greater issue? That the greater crisis that we're having in terms of our identity is that we've not yet submitted to who we are in Christ. I want to see a show of hands right now. If there's anybody who's bold enough to raise your hand and say, I'm going to be baptized today. I want to see a show of hands right now. Is there anybody here that's going to be baptized? Praise the Lord, Sister Andrea. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Is there anybody else? Come on, church. Come on, church. Come on, church. If we've not been baptized yet and you've given your life to Jesus Christ for a long time, we're half-stepping. We're unsure of who we are in Christ. Serving Jesus it's not an easy thing. He said, does a man not first consider how much it costs to build the, the house before he begins to build? Some of us, like James said, will be tossed about like waves upon the water because we still doubt and have not put trust in Jesus Christ. My prayer today is that those of us that the Lord is speaking to will obey and know beyond a shadow of a doubt who you are in Jesus and what he's done for you. And now, what your response is going to be to him out of thanksgiving for the mercy and for the grace and for the pardon of our sins that he's poured out and shed upon us.